I am very happy to say I'm with somebody who's been tirelessly campaigning for LGBT rights and I'm very also proud to say I've been a friend of yours for 10 years, Sean Delenti. Thank you very much. Yeah. And in that time I've never interviewed you. Why not? Well, the time has come. <laughs> <laughs> Here we are. Fabulous new book, very exciting. I have to say, I haven't read all of it yet, but I will be. Must try harder. I know, that's terrible, isn't it? Really bad admission. But it's so fantastic what I've seen. And we had the book launch, you had a uh, book launch for this at uh, Regent Street Cinema. Yes. Which you kindly invited us to, and it was fantastic, because you had the screening of Pride, the movie. But we'll talk about that in a minute, because I first want to know why you started writing this book, but also go back in history a little bit. So my background, uh, in case people don't know, is that I'm in education. I've been in education since 1992. <laughs> So I've worked as a class teacher, primary school. I've worked as a school leader. I've worked as a school governor. And I've also done what's called um, improving schools consultancy. So that meant that for two days a week, every week, I would go out of my school and travel around other schools in London and help them improve. I'm actually going to pass you over to the man who was responsible for this wonderful evening and this wonderful book, Mr. Sean Delenti. Thank you very much, Lindsay. Lindsay is an author too. Yeah. <laughs> Lindsay wrote a very fabulous Twin Peaks cookbook, which is available around the world and has some damn fine recipes in it, I have to say. Really yeah, surreal to be stood here with a book in my hand and people coming on to, uh, to help me launch it. So I hugely appreciate the fact that you're all here. It means a lot, um, but not as much as I hope this book will mean to schools and young people because that's who it's really for. There is a reason for writing this book. Um, what was your main reason, would you say? Is it because you want to help other people? And also, I would imagine it's quite a cathartic thing to, to write this. Back in 2009, while I was minding my own business, working as a class teacher and a school leader, we did some questionnaires around bullying with our students, with our primary school students. And to my utmost horror, when we got that data back, 75% of our primary school aged pupils were experiencing homophobic bullying and 98% of them were hearing the word gay used as a cuss, you know, mm. it's so gay, that's so gay, all of that stuff. And kind of a light bulb went off in my head really because um, as is reasonably well known now, um, I was very badly bullied as a younger man and as a teenager and that nearly resulted in me um, taking my own life mm. uh, when I was around age 17. But it meant that I walked out of education, stayed out of education with no real exams um, and it continues to affect my life, really, all, all the way through it. So the thought that my children in school, in my care, might be put in that position in 2009 was completely unacceptable to me. I looked around to see what support was available for primary schools around homophobic bullying, and actually none was forthcoming. So the larger LGBT organisations went, you can't do anything in primary schools because the Daily Mail will get hold of you, you know? Mm, yeah. But I had data that told me my children were suffering and you can't not do something about that. You know, imagine if that data had been about racism. You wouldn't just ignore it, you'd do something. So to cut a long story short, I um, bought lots of Advocar, got some mince pies, and over Christmas, <laughs> I, wrote, um, I wrote a training programme for teachers called Inclusion For All, and really that's the basis for that book. And that's a great process. Absolutely. You've got to Advocar do that. Advocar and mince pies yeah. is really great. Let us see a little bit. <laughs> Afterwards, after the film's been shown, um, we'll be doing a, a Q&A on stage. So if you need to go to the toilet, maybe nip out as soon as the credits start and then try and get uh, back before the end of the credits. Um, because we don't want to go on too long because the bar's going to be open at the end. By then, I'm really going to need a bloody drink. <laughs> you were talking about the fact that when you're bullied as a kid, I mean, it, it stays with you, doesn't it? It stays with you as an, as an adult because you're always remembering. When I started doing this work in 2009, immediately I encountered teaching professionals in primary schools and secondary schools and faith schools who thought that section 28 was still there and if viewers don't remember section 28 that was a piece of legislation under Mar Margaret Thatcher's government which essentially precluded schools and teachers from talking about lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender plus people because that was perceived as promoting being gay. Now let's think about that. If we talk about pottery in a school we're just teaching about it. If we talk about plants in a school, we're just teaching about it. If we talk about dogs in a school, we're just teaching about it. So when it's LGBT+, when we're talking about that, 
we're just teaching about it. It's just education and information. It's not promotion. That's a lie. That is fake news. Mm. But unfortunately, it's stuck. Okay, you spoke a little bit um, about your work with Inclusion for All, there, which, by the way, if you haven't checked out, was just the most amazing work that you did. Um, that was the last 10 years of your life. And how easy or challenging was it to undertake all of that incredible work? Um, do you know what? For, I think for the first eight years, I just kind of kept my head down because I'd always got this sense that I was getting away with something. And actually, very early on in my journey, the Department for Education and Ofsted and Stonewall uh, contacted me at the school I was working at then. And basically, that's what they said. They went, how is it you're getting away with doing this stuff in primary schools when other people have tried it and it's all blown up? And in fact, the first time No Outsiders ran as a project, I think it was in Bristol, and it blew up. Um, so that was the expectation for what I was doing, but it didn't blow up. You know, I think the nastiest situation I had was with somebody on LBC when I came out. I came out in school assembly and I came out, and the DJ kind of, he said to me, oh, so you came out in assembly, you know, why would you do that? It's, it's a private thing. And I just played along with it and said, yeah, I was dressed as Kylie Minogue, I had out the chaps on. <laughs> that's what we do. <laughs> just stop it, you know, just stop the silliness. But somehow, for whatever reason, I, I got away with it. But it shouldn't, we shouldn't be saying get away with it, because it's the right thing to do. Because all we're doing is making the school safe for everybody, and it also makes it safer for teachers and parents and carers as well. So once I realised that whatever, for whatever reason I could get away with it, it was like I picked up a big rainbow beach ball <laughs> and I ran as hard and fast as I could for around eight years. I've encountered over the years many education professionals who were frightened to uh, talk about LGBT plus identities in schools and that places young people at risk. And as you've quite rightly said, bullying of any kind, but particularly bullying about LGBT plus identities, which is a core aspect of your being, mm -hmm. you know, it's not something we have a choice over. If you're bullied for that, it doesn't just affect you during that lesson or that playtime or that school week or that month or that term or that school year. It potentially affects you for the rest of your life. And to me, as a school leader and as a human being, that's unacceptable. So in that respect, when you were writing this book, did it dig up a lot of the memories that you had when you were a kid? that came to the surface again that you'd forgotten about for years. So the book's kind of, I think it's 12 chapters, and the, and the first part of the book is very much a summarised memoir, if you like. So it's my story of, of growing up on planet Earth as a four or five year old, and just realising, you know, just very early on that I fancied Benny from ABBA. Um, Who didn't? With the beard. <laughs> um, funny that. When I went to the cinema as a five year old, and I was taken to see Dr No, the James Bond film, I looked at Sean Connery and thought, there's my future husband. You know, no one made me like that, except presumably nature and my parents. Nobody forced me to be like that, and I made no choice. It's just the way I was. Hey ho, and it's still the way I am. Yeah. And that's brilliant, and yeah. I take great joy in that, because being gay enables me to experience being on Earth and being a human being from a different perspective. I think it's a joyful thing, but sadly, as we know, there are many people out there in the world who think it's something they can use against us. Um, but for as long as I can remember being me, I've known who I am. So yeah, I summarise my life story in that book, but actually the bulk of it is uh, the now award-winning, multi-award-winning no. process of organisational and cultural change that I lead, have led hundreds and hundreds of schools on. Uh, and through and businesses and organisations over the last 10 years. Well, I'll take my hat off to you for doing what you do because you've got to have determination to keep pushing through those boundaries. Being on the other end of so much hate that's out there, thankfully it's not all around us because we have a lot of loving people that are around mm. us. But there is one section in this book that I loved and you touched on the music um, <laughs> because there are a lot of supportive musical artists that you have followed and I followed, I know your taste in music. Um, more recently we've had Troye Sivan, you mentioned him in the book. Madonna, of course, we know has been tirelessly supporting our cause as mm. well. That's quite an important thing, isn't it? To have these people that young people especially admire and have that support from, from these people in a, in a really positive way. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's vital. I, I mean, music is so intertwined in our experience of being on planet Earth. And, you know, it was funny, when I first started writing the book, I actually went back and kind of dug out some of the CDs that I'd listened to as a young gay man 
who was being very badly bullied, whose parents didn't know, uh, who thought that he could never tell anybody who he really was. So I found my friends through music, really, by you know listening to Bronski beat CDs and, and, and just listening out for the odd lyric that I thought, oh, actually, that's a man talking about another man. Or, and that's what Jimmy did really well, absolutely. wasn't it, Jimmy Somerville? Um, and it meant just those little things meant so much. Um, plus, you know, particularly in the, in the 80s, in, in that kind of era just before HIV AIDS hit, there was this real sense of optimism that was being driven by people like Boy George, you know, the Blitz Kids, the onset of Electronica, all of that. And it felt very hopeful. And people were kind of pushing the boundaries around gender and expression. And it was exciting and it was vibrant and it contributed to keeping me and I'm sure other people on the planet. Plus the music was really good as oh well. Oh my God, and it's that, <laughs> it's that whole punk attitude as well, isn't it? Yeah. It's not, not giving a, a care for people that are really negative towards you for yeah. being who you are. And, yeah, and, and actually that important. communal experience of being at a gig you know, having having grown up, I used to have to spend a lot of time near football grounds because my my one of my family was a policeman and um, he used to police the football matches in Leicester on a Saturday and we would be in close proximity. So I saw the most terrible acts of aggression and violence. Mm. But then when I started going to gigs, I'm like, there's 2,000 people in Leicester de Montfort Hall or Leicester University. I saw the Smiths there. Yeah. Hmm, maybe not such a good thing anymore. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. But th that feeling of, of 2,000 people in a room, all there for the same thing, and that bonding and cohesion. And for me, that's what being a human being is about. The Absolutely, only, that the solidarity. Only, yeah, isn't it? you know, that, life's too short to be, to be spent on hate and division and prejudice. Um, and the only other time that I've really felt that is the first time I went to the RVT on a Sunday. It's family thing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It does feel like your family. I mean, that sounds quite quite corny, but it's true, isn't it? Is that Towser Schnauzer? Yeah, it's Towser. <laughs> He's here. Towser He's Schnauzer. Shot in a bit. He's having a lie down. He's gorgeous. <laughs> so let's now um, think about the film Pride. Why did you choose the film Pride? Well, first of all, it's Pride Month. Hashtag Pride Month. You know, if I think about all the Prides that I've been to, for some reason this year Pride Month feels really, really, really important. It's important every year, but this year there's a real extra resonance to it. Uh, and that was one of the reasons why we wanted to show this film tonight. A, because it's Pride Month. B, because it's a bloody great film. Um, C, because our histories and stories need to be told. But also, the last time I watched this film, this uh, dialogue really jumped out at me, and I'm going to read it to you now. When you're in a battle against an enemy of who's so much bigger, so much stronger than you, to find out that you had a friend you never knew existed, well, that's the best feeling in the world. And we have enemies, and those enemies are getting stronger and they're getting louder. And that means that we need our friends, it means that we need our allies, and it means that we all need to be there for each other. <coughs> with Pride. Um, that's one thing I loved about your, your book launch because you had Pride the movie, you know, as the movie to be screened before your Q&A. And it was so joyous. Um, and obviously it's a very serious subject because it, it, it's kind of fighting through the negative attitudes of people back in the 80s. And it, obviously it was a very, it was a terrible time for, for, for gay rights, but in some ways it was victorious as well. But that film was so funny, yet so heartfelt. Mm. It felt like a celebration, which actually I've got to say is a brilliant title as well because it's a very positive thing. I think it is. I'm glad you said that because actually I've had quite a lot of flack about the title. Oh, have you? Yeah. Interestingly, I wasn't going to call it Celebrating Difference, if I'm honest. I was going to call it Inclusion for All because that's historically been the name of my work. Bloomsbury, who were the publisher, they chose the title. And actually, I'm, I'm happy with it, but on social media, and I knew it was going to happen, people have attacked me. Some people have attacked me, which is nothing new, because that happens all the time. You're used to that. I'm used to that. Yeah. You know, I've had death threats. I've had, oh, all of it. I could, I could sit and write it out myself and send it to myself. I've had it for 10 years. Yeah, but some people don't like the spotlight being put on the difference. You know, recently they've been saying to me, oh, we've, we've worked for years for equality. We've worked for years to be assimilated. And actually what you're doing is, is putting the spotlight back on difference. But isn't also that being unique as well? Because yeah. everyone is unique in their own way, aren't Absolutely. they? Absolutely. And that's very much, that's the core of the way I work. Because, you know, having done this for 10 years now, what makes my work distinctive from somebody like Stonewall, for example, or diversity role models, is I don't kind of go in there with a package and go, this is how you become LGBT plus friendly, this is what you do. What I do is kind of go in there and, and, and say to people, I'm a human being and I've had prejudices. Mm. Let me talk about them with you. Let's explore them together. What might yours be? 
how does it feel when I ask you that question? How do you respond to that? So I kind of go in at this very personal level because I believe change begins with us as individuals and as individuals, we're all different. So why the hell not talk about that and celebrate it? Because for me, the fact that I'm mainly attracted to men is, is my core, it's part of my core identity. Mm. I had no choice over it whatsoever. Mm. Um, maybe it, it, under societal pressure, I could have forced it into a box and tried to deny it. But most people that I know that end up having a breakdown. Yeah, yeah. It's not healthy. Yeah. And, you know, it's like our initial student questionnaires that we did. You know, we, we hesitated because it's about gay stuff. But if it had been about race, we wouldn't have hesitated. Yeah, yeah. So where do you find that power? Where, where do you find that power to fight through all this? And especially with that criticism, even criticism for the title of your book, <laughs> you're getting it everywhere, aren't you? It's yeah. Yeah, you do. You, you do get it from everywhere. It's exhausting, surely. Yeah, I mean, self-care is really important, and, I, and that's something I've had to learn over 10 years, yeah. is, is noticing when I'm going into negative numbers and, 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 t and making choices that, that kind of nourish me. So sometimes I do have to step back, and I'm not an organisation. I'm just me. So I don't have sponsorship. I don't have funding. I don't have a PA. Everything you see is, is me, really. What drives me, what keeps me going, is the thought that any of the naturally diverse young people that it will ever be my privilege to meet, to know, to teach, that they should be made to feel dehumanised just because they've been born trans or intersex or gay or asexual or whatever it is whatever it is maybe they've just got the wrong trainers on or the wrong haircut and people are using it against them mm. the thought of what nearly happened to me and what i know has happened to countless people around the world the thought of that happening to anybody drives me so in a way it's like i take all of this dark stuff and i flip it back around and try and turn it into light stuff and i think where we are in the world now and where we are as a country, the press and certain politicians and on social media, that narrative is constantly being taken to the dark and what's going wrong. And it's important to tell those stories, but all of us need to take greater responsibility and be more proactive in also telling good, hopeful, optimistic stories. It's needed more than ever, isn't it, this book, I think. I, I would say it's like a warm blanket. I love that. It's, it's like a warm blanket. Snuggly. You know what you need when you have a warm blanket? Yeah. You need a biscuit. <laughs> Celebrating difference biscuit. Who thought... Trying to sell his biscuits Who now. thought <laughs> that I would ever have a biscuit with a book cover on it? That's really quite surreal. But if you get hungry later in the interview, there you go. Well, that's the thing, because I saw these at your book launch, and I, I wondered if they were vegan. I said, oh, God, oh, <laughs> listen to me. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. I have my own biscuits now. <laughs> <laughs> biscuits are cool. So I can't actually enjoy those, I'm afraid, but uh, um, they do look delicious. They look, they look nice on a wall. You can wear them at pride parades. That would be your next challenge, and to make you, a vegan yeah. biscuit. And if you see Morrissey, you can perhaps throw it. No. I feel really critical now, <laughs> like I'm poo-pooing your biscuits. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to tell, uh, talk to you about the um, pie chart, which is, uh, like I said, I haven't read all of it, but the bits that I have read, I, I, I've enjoyed. But there's one bit that stood out for me, was the pie chart, where you basically um, kind of, analyze your your life and put it into sections of what what you do in your pastimes and what takes up a huge chunk of your life and obviously work is a huge chunk of that as is i think walking the dog walking the dog it's a good yeah. priority absolutely yeah. i think it's 32 percent, isn't it work yeah yeah 32 percent sleeping yeah sometimes <laughs> but down right the road bottom one percent is getting jiggy I, I cannot have the same discussion on Twitter anymore with people where I basically say LGBT people are not just about sex. No. In the same way that straight people are not just about sex. Yeah, in, in the book there's a pie chart that I use when I'm training. It's a bit of a joke. So it's, it's my life and it's split up into chunks. So this, uh, I mean these are very rough, I'm rubbish and lovers. Um, never taught maths very well. Um, but there's like a section on um, writing, a section on eating, sleeping. Going to the gym, uh, going to the theatre, and then there's like a two percent of it at the bottom. It's actually the smallest slice, slice, and that's no, um, that's no, uh, no slide on Mike and I. Um, there's there's a slice, and it says jiggy jiggy. And whenever I'm out training with teachers or people of faith or whatever it is. Um, I put it up and, and I get them to look at it and they, they, I did it in a school recently, there's some people here that were there. Um, <laughs> yay! Hey, and, and I pointed it and I go, that's the smallest part of who I am and yet that is the bit of us that we're defined by. Mm. Some people still see particularly gay men as a walking sex act. Yeah, yeah. 
Which, by the way, isn't a sex act that only gay men can do. (laughs) (laughs) So the pie chart started as a bit of a joke. So when I go and work in primary schools and secondary schools and faith schools and teacher training institutes, um, I have slides because it's good to have something visual. Now, I noticed really early on in this this work that I do that, um, and I'd experienced it all through my life, you'll have experienced it as well as, as, a, as a gay man, if we put those labels on ourselves, that there are many, many people in the world who define LGBT plus people not by their personality, not by their laughter, their tears, their songs, their friendships, their jokes, their cookery. They don't define them by that. They define them by one particular aspect of their lives that they may or may not do. So I created a a half serious pie chart for my slides, which breaks down, as you've said, all the activities I do in life. So eating, sleeping, going to the gym, believe it or not. Um, I don't know, walking the dog, writing, which I've obviously been doing a lot of. And then right at the the bottom of it, there's kind of one, two percent which represents my sex life, and that's, that, that doesn't reflect badly on my husband. But it's, it's, <laughs> that's just the way it is. I'm a very busy man. I would say that's probably more than most people <laughs> get, to be honest. That's social media for you. <laughs> um, and, but that, you know, when I show that slide and point it out, and I go, but that's, for so many people, what they define people like me and you by. So when they find out we're gay or bi or trans or whatever, they immediately obsess about sexual acts or what we might do or not do in bed or in the kitchen or wherever it is. Isn't it funny? It's that like constant jibes that always yeah, yeah. refer to that. And, and so you're defined by that. But also, if you think about what's happening right now with the schools in Birmingham, where there's been a, a very voracious, vociferous, is that the word? A very strong. You're asking me? Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, a very strong and very strategized pushback against LGBT education. Um, which is ongoing actually but if you look at some of the banners they're all about not sexualizing children and letting children be children and 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 you can see underneath that that there are people there whose prejudice is driven by the fact that they define LGBT plus people purely by a sexual act that's not how I define other human beings you know if I walk into a, a school and there's a hundred staff um, predominantly heterosexual, I don't immediately start obsessing about what they might have done in bed that morning or, or the evening before because that's not how I define and judge and it's a, private a thing. human being and it's a private thing. And everybody deserves their privacy. But you can understand then, you know, uh, it, it, let's say I go into a primary school and read a book about gay penguins or, or I show a photo of Mike and I, my husband, to show what my family looks like. A child goes home and says to a parent, oh this man came in with a dodgy beard, talked about being gay, and that parent goes off on one, and they go off on one because what they think in their head is that I went in there and got up, I don't know, gay porn hub or something, whatever that is, on, on the screen or I've got a book of gay porn out, because that's how they define people like us. So in a way, I can understand why they kick off. So for me, it's about working with these misconceptions and these limited interpretations of us as human beings. We are so much more It's crazy, isn't it? Uh, And I really do seriously hope that no one calls your beard a dodgy beard, if that ever happens. It's been called many things. (laughs) How dare they? been called many things. I, I'm quite fond of it. Towser Schnauzer's beard is better. <laughs> He's looking gorgeous. Uh, last time I saw him, he actually stayed here because we looked after him while you w- and went away with work. And he was freshly groomed. Yeah. And now he looks like a teddy bear. He does. He's very big and fluffy. But yeah. then, you know, so am I. So. Well, there you go. They always say, don't they? <laughs> Increasingly big. Dog owners look like their dogs. Cheers for that, Phil. Yeah, Thank cute. you. Oh, there we go. He's in shot now. <laughs> we just paused briefly just to pick up the cute pup. Well, I say puppy. Is he 10 now? Yeah. Hello. Gorgeous. So, yeah, so hopefully you are getting support. You're getting that warm blanket along with Towser. Yeah, I mean, I, my support really comes from, uh, well, my husband, yep. Mike, without yep. whom. It also comes from this fella here, Towser the Schnauzer, the legend that is Towser the Schnauzer. Um, you know, my friends and family. But really, you know, I'm not, as I said before, I'm not an organisation, I'm, I'm me. So I need people to kind of retweet me. I need people to, um, you know, word of mouth. But I guess what I really need is people to to buy that book. And, you know, I've asked everywhere that I've spoken in the last few weeks, because I'm doing a a kind of book tour of as many different places as I can. Um, You've been to more places than Madonna. 
I, yeah, I, I, I am. She's yeah, had yeah. against the Palladium. That's it. Yeah. If only, if only I had the wardrobe, <laughs> and I could charge those prices for tickets. I'll see you with a few <laughs> costume changes. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I look great in a conical bra. Um, <laughs> Famous last words. Yeah, yeah. Oops, there's my pride out for sorted. Um, yeah, so I, you know, I'm travelling around the country throughout the year doing book talks and, and book signings, which is very surreal, but, but 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 nice that people want me to do that. I think I'm speaking at Gaze the Word in November for yeah. Anti Bullying Week, which is fantastic. In demand, it's great. Yeah, um, but that's fine. But we need people to buy the book. Yeah. And what I've been suggesting to people is that um, if they buy two copies, one for themselves. But buy another copy. Yeah. Buy a copy for the school, school that you went to. And if you can afford it, buy a copy for your local school. Because if everybody that watched this video did that, just think of the difference we could start making from here. You, you said to me right at the start that this is really serious work, but actually the way I approach it is with a twinkle and with fun and compassion. Because it's relatable, isn't it? Because people get that. Yeah, and I think that's really important. And I think it is important to keep a sense of humour because I get the most outrageous things said to me. You know, I get death threats, I get this, that and the other. And if I don't, if I'm not able to laugh at it sometimes, um, then it would take me down, you know? It's about acting without any shame. It's about being celebratory and it's about being joyful because we've got a choice in life with our words and our actions. We can either make people feel like they belong on planet Earth or we can make them feel like they are less than and they don't deserve to be here. Mm. And I think in these difficult times, all of us within the LGBT plus community, within ourselves, within our own community, I think we all need to be kinder and more supportive for each other. Um, but also we need to be reaching out there for allies. And by allies, I don't mean, oh yeah, we've got a rainbow flag in our office. I mean a deep, genuine commitment to standing up for the rights of other people who are different to you. And reach out and talk to people. Yeah, yeah. And be mindful of it as well. Be mindful of your actions. You use the word mindful there, and that really underpins this book and the work that I do and the approach that I take. And it, again, probably makes my work quite distinctive because, you know, I, I'm a long-term meditator. So for me, you know, I'm, I'm a human being. I've got prejudices too, and I've had to learn to notice them and notice when they're triggered and then work proactively and positively with them. And really that, that approach underpins my approach to this work. And, and again, as a community, I think that's something we all need to be doing a bit more is noticing when our own prejudices are triggered. What's, what's really significant, I think, about this book, if you think about it, it's been written by somebody that's been working in education for 20 years, that's been a school leader, that's been an improving schools consultant, that's also had that rich, you know, it's a real privilege to have had these experiences. Um, that rich experience of, of helping to move the education system to a place where it's more LGBT plus inclusive. So all of that feeds into that book. So yes, it's a book written by a school leader for, a school, for school leaders and teachers, but actually I think you've kind of picked up on it as well. There's a bigger picture in there. Mm. It's actually a book for, for anybody to help them think about their own prejudices, to, for anybody that works with young people well, it's human um, rights, isn't it? Yeah, it's Full a, stop. I hope it's a very human book, and, yeah. a, and I hope it's a funny book, I hope it's a kind book. My aim for it um, is very simple. I want to get a copy of that into every school in the country, then we'll go for the world. Now, how I do that, I don't know. That's going to require funding, it's going to require sponsorship of some, some kind, but I want to get that to every... Just think of the change we could make. Oh my God, it'd be wonderful, you know? especially now more than ever, I think. Absolutely, it's, and we're seeing what's going on in Birmingham, we're seeing, um, we're seeing our identities being questioned in Parliament again. You know, who thought we would see that happening again? And what really concerns me is that we were only just getting over Section 28. We'd only, you know, if we were really over it. Um, and some of us haven't lived, you know, some of us haven't lived and survived to get to the point where Section 28 becomes a memory. And then we have some politicians and uh, some uh, forces trying to stir things up to push mm. things back. The antidote to that, I believe, is a book like this. And for me, you know, I know I've written it, but regardless of that, I think it's a really, really important book and we need to get it to every school leader in the land.